Some of the old Puritan writers, I'm not sure who was the first or when it was first used, spoke of pastors as being physicians of souls. Those who had as their task in part to diagnose specific spiritual problems in people's lives, in the the lives of the sheep, and to seek to bring the word of God to bear upon those things so as to, to apply a balm where a balm was needed, to apply the surgeon's knife where the surgeon's knife was needed, to come and to seek to be in the hands of God an instrument to help and to help his people to become more holy. And so I'm conscious of that uh, imagery and in a sense going to be using that in the sermon this morning. None of us really likes, I think, to go to the doctors, at least uh, many of us anyway, have reluctance in going to doctors and having them poke and probe and, and ask questions that we don't really want to ans- answer. We don't really want to say we're sick, do we? When it really comes down to it, we don't like going to the doctor because we don't like admitting that we're getting old We're breaking down, and we're actually beaten by these little microscopic bugs we can't see. We don't want to admit that, do we? We just don't like that fact about ourselves. And yet it's necessary for us to go to doctors. It's necessary for us to take the direction that they give us, to take the treatments that they give us, to take the medicine that they give us in order that we might be healthy, in order that we might be as strong as we possibly can to continue to live and to serve God in this world. Paul was clearly a magnificent physician of the soul. He knew how to diagnose problems. He knew when he saw a problem how to address the problem. And he did it with great precision and great help to the people that he ministered to in the early century and then also through his writings To us, by the Spirit of God, we have this passage before us as a passage that I want to use to diagnose and to treat some malady in us. Now, my first point is, what is that malady? What is that condition that is addressed? Well, the condition that I want to address this morning is the condition of anxiety, the condition of anxiety. Paul says, be anxious for nothing, or do not be anxious for anything. Now, I know the word, and some of you know that this word is used by Paul to describe his anxiety for all the churches, and that's used in a positive sense in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 28. The pressure that weighed down upon him as the apostle to the Gentiles and the one who oversaw all the churches. The word is also used in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 to describe how the married individual has more anxiety, in a sense more concerns than the single person has because of the marriage relationship. And there again, it's not being used in a, in a, in a negative sense. It's not describing a sin per se, but a reality of life. But by and large, on the vast amount of times, the most times this, this word is used in our New Testaments, used in our Bibles, it is speaking of an undue concern which causes agitation in the heart. It's speaking of an excessive worry, an excessive tension in the soul, sometimes a feeling of dread, an overwhelming fear for either real or perceived dangers. It was Baxter who said that even if we could get rid of the tens or dozens of real dangers in our lives, our minds would conceive of thousands more. You see, it's not just the real things, but it's the perceived or the potential problems difficulties and trials that produce or are the circumstances in which we have anxiety. Now, anxiety is often indicated 
uh, or demonstrated as in us, the patients, as uh, elevated passions. Uh, we're irritable very quickly. Or we cry on a moment's notice. Or we're unusually fearful about something. It's also manifested at times in that intensified confusion. I say intensified because some of us live in that state of confusion. But there's an intensified sense of that. That often comes along with this thing called anxiety. It affects the mind. It affects the affections. It affects our will. It even, at times, is attended by physical symptoms, is it not? When we find ourselves getting anxious, we find that knot in our stomachs, unable to eat because we're sick to our stomachs. Or there's that uh, increased blood pressure, sleeplessness, nervousness. You see, anxiety is the thing that Paul is addressing here. And it, anxiety is this agitation of soul that manifests itself in so many different ways and in different people. Now, there's a sense in which it's common to the human race. Is it not to be anxious? But it's not merely a human trait, like breathing. Nor is it uncontrollable, like our heartbeat. Anxiety is not something we catch, like a bacterial upper respiratory infection. You don't catch it. Anxiety is a response. Anxiety is something that we do in response to circumstances, situations, or perceptions. Now, this is not the only passage where anxiety is addressed. But here where it says, deals with anxiety, Paul makes it very clear, isn't it, that anxiety is forbidden. And so anxiety is not merely any old response. Anxiety is a sinful response. It's a wrong response. It's a harmful response. It is a sinful response. Now, some of you are maybe sitting there thinking about me. And you're thinking, well, you know, I, I don't think Pastor Carlson's generally an anxious kind of person. Or you're thinking about that person that you know, like Pastor Chansky, who just seems to... You know, and, and it just, there's that levelness about them. that they, they, It's just in their nature. They must never be anxious. You know, and when they talk about anxiety, these people with these upbeat personalities and, and this ability to kind of just seem to go along with that steady perspective on life, that we can tend to think, well, that's just their personality. That's not me. Well, it may not be you, but, but that personality is not what constitutes not being anxious. Because even somebody like that can be anxious. Paul was not a, a, an ivory tower theologian when he wrote about anxiety. He wasn't sitting in a monastery somewhere or sitting in a library somewhere in a nice cushy chair describing, don't be anxious while sipping his latte. He's not doing that. Paul is writing to these people about not being anxious in circumstances which would make many of us incredibly anxious. Paul is writing from a prison cell. A prison cell in Rome. A prison cell miles away from these beloved Christians in Philippi. He is separated from those who are dear to him. They are separated from him. He does not have the privilege of being in their presence. This is the kind of thing that causes somebody anxiety, especially since Paul was, had invested his life in seeing the gospel preached in Philippi and seeing a church established there. Paul had been helped by the church in Philippi, but for a time before this letter came, before a time, they had stopped sending him money. They had stopped sending him support. And so therefore, he talks about in Philippians chapter 4, 
that he knew what it was to be hungry and thirsty because he wasn't receiving from others. Those are kinds of things that can make some of us anxious, can't they? Where's my next meal going to come from? Or some of us get anxious, can I eat that or can't I eat that? Paul was facing these kinds of circumstances which produced anxiety in many of people. His future seems very, very uncertain. Will he be set free or will he be executed? Some are using Paul's circumstances for their own personal benefit. We read in Philippians chapter 1 that there are some who are actually going about promoting their ministries in such a way so as to produce pain, they hope, in Paul's heart. Now, doesn't it make you, aren't you at least tempted, some of us, to be anxious, to be fearful, to have that agitation of soul when, when we see people around us turning the circumstances in such a way that we're going to look bad and they're going to look good? They might end up with the promotion and I might end up with the pink slip? Aren't those the kind of circumstances that can produce anxiety in our lives? And it's the one who was facing those kinds of circumstances who says, be anxious for nothing. Paul's concern for the unity of this church. He writes in Philippians chapter 2, some very clear descriptions for them, that they be unified. If there is any encouragement of Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. He wants them to be unified. He knows that they are fearful. For the one that they have sent, this Epaphroditus, who was dear to them, was sick unto death. And that produced anxiety in the Philippians. Well, this one that they loved was, was sick and to the point of, of possibly dying. And Paul agrees that, yeah, that would have been sorrowful for me and it would have been sorrowful for you. This is, this is the kind of circumstance that produces anxiety. He paints a picture of the world at several places in this book, of a world that's filled with darkness, that's, that, that's not conducive to living a gospel life. False teachers are out there, and there's the danger of the people of God being sucked in and becoming legalists, turning their back on the gospel that was once preached to them. And there's even tension between brethren. There's sin in the church. And that sin has to be addressed publicly. We read in, in Philippians chapter 4, the first few per verses of the, ch of the book, or excuse me, of the chapter, Philippians chapter 4, my beloved brethren whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Yodia, I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true comrade, comrade, I ask you also to help these women. There's tension in the church. And he publicly addresses it. He publicly addresses it so that it could be corrected. Anxious circumstances. Circumstances which can lead to people feeling worried. So is anxiety ever, ever acceptable? Is this sinful, undue concern? Well, just by putting that first word in there, don't I? I give it away. You've heard, Pastor Martin, we all have, haven't we? Be anxious for no thing. No thing. Are humans things? Are human relations things? Yes. In one sense, not in the, okay, I know not things, but people, I understand it, but they're things, right? They're part of the world of things, realities. And what they do is part of that world, and how they live are our salaries and our bills, things. Is our health and or our sickness, things. 
is our physical strength and ability, the clothing that we wear, the food that we eat or don't eat, our house, our cars, our appliances, our jobs. Are these all things? Well, then there's nothing there that fits into the category that we can be anxious about. Because we're to be anxious for nothing. No thing. But we all feel it, don't we? At one level or another, one circumstance or another, one time or another, we all feel that anxiety. That creeping up on the soul that's going to squeeze it tight and make us fret, make us worry, make us sin. Well, now what's the treatment? What's the treatment? How does one treat anxiety? Well, the treatment is peace. Simply enough, Paul says he wants them to have peace. But peace is not a pill. And peace doesn't come in a pill. And peace is not a psychological trick. And peace is not just playing around with games. Now, I'm not making any statement about whether you should be taking medication or not for specific ailments, right? It's not my point this morning. What I'm looking at this morning is what Paul says about how to deal with this thing called anxiety. And he says the answer is peace. And you don't find it in a bottle, and you don't find it in, in running around like a chicken with his head cut off, and you, you don't find it by playing mind games with yourself. It's a gift. It's a gift. And so we need to seek that gift. Now, Paul gives us what I'm calling a prescription for peace. And Harry, if you want a title, that's the title, Prescription for Peace. I'm, I'm calling the prescription for peace, there's three parts to the, to the treatment, three parts to this prescription, three things that Paul writes on that little slip. And the first thing is in verse 6, he says, introduce your concerns to God. Introduce your concerns to God. There's two imperatives in verse 6. The first is, do not be anxious or be anxious for nothing. And the second is, let your request be made known to God. Now, that's kind of an interesting way of saying it. I don't know that I would have said it that way. I mean, I, that's not the way I've necessarily interpreted the verse in the past. But when looking at the verse, this is what he says. He says, let your request be made known to God. In other words, don't hinder them being introduced to God. Bring them out to God. Allow them to be introduced. Don't allow them to remain hidden. Now, they can be remain hidden for lots of different reasons. We, we're, we're too careless to deal with them, or we're too afraid to bring them out. But the point is that Paul says... Get those specific requests, those specific concerns, those precise needs, those personal desires, those personal wishes, those specific circumstances, that specific person. He says, and then bring them out, all of those concerns, and introduce them to God. All right, Mr. About to Lose My Job, meet my God. All right, child that is driving me crazy, that I don't know what you're going to do with your life, this anxiety, meet my God. Let these requests, these concerns, these burdens, these desires be known unto God. Whatever you are fearful about, whatever you're doubting, whatever you're worrying about, Whoever the circumstances, whoever the individuals, whatever the possibility that you're looking at in the future that might just be the fiscal cliff for you or the familial cliff for you, say, well, temptation to worry on that particular stand, but meet my God. I want you to come into the presence of my God. You are tempting me to be anxious. And Paul tells me as a good doctor that the thing I need to do is introduce you to my God. Literally bring it right to God. Bring it into his presence. 
Don't allow it to hide under the table. Don't allow it to remain deep within the soul. Don't allow it to just run around in the corners of your mind. Get it out in the presence of God. And he says, then he tells us, he said, but by what means do I get that out before God? Well, that's the way I would have written the verse. Be anxious for nothing, pray. But that's not the way he wrote it. He says, introduce it to God by means of prayer. And he uses a couple of words. He talks about requests. We've already seen that. Those specific things, specific needs, specific desires. But then he says also there's this word for prayer, which means just crying out in worshipful devotion. In the normal worship of God, in your normal interactions with God, when you're speaking with God, he says, bring those things out in those contexts. And set them before your God. And then he also says, with supplication. Or by supplication. And this is a more specific word. Sometimes it's, it's much more earnest and much more specific. A really crying out for this particular thing. Maybe it's because the pressure has gotten a little bit tighter. I love the illustration. I've used it before. I'm going to use it time and time again. Dr. Beakey used it and it made sense with me. For those of you who are woodworkers, you might understand this better than I do. He talked about uh, putting two pieces of wood into a clamp and seeking to glue those pieces of wood, wood together and you clamp down and you keep clamping down until the wood squeaks. So you tighten it down far enough, pretty soon the wood squeaks in the, under the pressure of the clamps. And he says that's what our circumstances are often like where God is bringing us these circumstances that are squeezing us until we squeak, that is, until we come to God and stop hiding these things deep down inside and stuffing them down underneath the rug somewhere, but get them out into the presence of God. Say, God, this, this is, I, I'm going to squeak. It's, it's too much. I'm not going to be anxious. I'm going to bring it into your presence by prayer, by entreaty, by specific request. And then he says, you know, when you do this, you must do it just like you have to take your medicine sometimes with a glass of milk or with a glass of water. He says, do this with thanksgiving. You got to bring thanksgiving with this. This is the way we make these things known unto God, into the presence of God, because that's a very humbling thing, isn't it? To have to stop and say, thank you, Lord. Thank, thank you for this. Thank you for that. We're, we're taking that posture of one who has received and one who is in need Thankful for past mercies. Lord, you've been there in the past for me. Thankful for present blessings. Lord, I know that your promises are still true. None of them have changed. Nothing is, has, is different. I see all around me, and even in the midst of whatever pain I have, I see all of these other blessings that are still there that you're pouring out upon me, and I'm going to count those blessings. I'm going to bring those things as well. There's that child, for instance, who's, who's going in a wayward path and, 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 and you know that he or she is, is headed down a very difficult road. And everything in you is anxious. Where are they going to end up? What might they do and what might they end up with? And you're tempted to be anxious. You bring it out into the presence of God and then you say, but you know, Lord, they're still alive. You know, Lord, they haven't done it yet. You know, Lord, you've kept them back and you've restrained them from going any further. I'm going to thank you, Lord, for those blessings. I thank you that they still, I'm still aware of their presence. I thank you for whatever contact I'm able to have with them. I'm thankful for whatever else you're doing in their lives. I'm thankful for some of the difficulties you've brought into their lives to hedge them up. Thank the Lord for the blessings, the present blessings in the midst of this very circumstance that I'm presently feeling. These are the things I'm thankful for. And thankful that there is a firmly grounded assurance for the future. That however bad things are now, and however difficult things are now, I have an absolute certainty that there is a day coming when all this pain is going to be gone. And I have an absolute certainty that the promises of the gospel are still the same, and if they at some point, or that circumstance at some point, comes face to face with the gospel, it can change. And I am assured and my Lord's going to come one day. 
One commentator summarized this point this way. He said, I may tell myself over and over that I will not worry, I will not fret, but my thoughts, like untamed horses, with the bit in their teeth, seem to run away with me. Or like an attacking army, they crowd into the citadel of my mind and threaten to overwhelm me. He says, and that's when I come into the presence of God. And I bring all of those things into the presence of the living God. So the first thing, introduce your temptation. Introduce those things to your God by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. But second, get on a different treadmill. Get on a different treadmill. You know, often anxiety is, is like, for those of you who go to gyms, going to the gym, sitting on a stationary bike, and having playing in front of you. Imagine the cheesiest two-minute YouTube video over and over and over and over again. And there you are on the bike, and you got this big flat screen TV going in front of you, and it's this same thing, and you're going, hey, could you get another video? Could we run something else here? Oh, great, I get a commercial, an infomercial. I've seen that 4,000 times. And it just runs around and around and around, and the more energy you put into it, you're not getting anywhere fast or anywhere away from it, and that's what anxiety is like, is it not? Where it just gets in your mind, and it goes and it goes and it goes, and you start running, but you're not getting away from anything. Paul would say, get off the cycle and get onto a treadmill. That's verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Let your mind dwell on these things. The fallen human tendency, brethren, is to be a rubbernecker. The human tendency is to dwell upon the darkness. We read about, we hear about devastation from a tsunami. We want to Google every image we can to see just what happened. We hear about some tragedy that's on happened, and we're looking at every video to try to figure out, whoa, they interviewed that person, they found out about that, and we want to get all this information. Why? We get all upset at these rubberneckers, right, that cause all the traffic. But then when we get up next to the accident, what do we do? Right? We're, we're, we're tempted to do the same thing. And anxiety is kind of like spiritual rubbernecking. i got to keep looking at this thing that's bothering me. i got to keep looking at this thing. And Paul says, get on a different treadmill. Fix your minds on these things. It's, a, it's an accounting term in which you are to come and you're to take account of something and do a detailed, logical thinking through of the issue. He says, that's what I want you to do. I said, I want you to fix your mind on dealing with these things. The answer to anxiety is not apathy. The answer to anxiety is not transcendental meditation and get out and empty your mind of everything. The answer to anxiety, in part, is get on a different treadmill. Get away from the infomercial and start thinking about other things. And look what he tells us to think about. What treadmill does he want us to jump on? He wants us to jump on the truth treadmill. That which is true. That which is sincere. That which is, that which is foundational, which is unchanging. That which we know to be absolutely true. Clearly God's word. Jesus, who is the truth. But that which is true, not that which is false, not that which is erroneous, think about what is true. 
Who is this uncircumcised Philistine who stands before the armies of the living God? Oh, yeah, you're just a Philistine standing before the armies of the living God. Oh, you curse me in the names of your gods? I'll take you out in the name of mine. I'm not sitting here going to look at that problem. I'm going to see what's true. My God is the one whom we serve. We are his army. Think about what is honorable, what is dignified. Get your mind out of the dirt. Get your mind out of, out of what's ignoble, what's unworthy, and fix your mind on that which is, is elevated among men, that which is noble, that which draws your attention as something which is exalted and to be appreciated. Fix your mind on that which is correct, that which is right, that which is straight, that which actually meets the standard in the particular circumstance that you're in. Fix your mind on that which is pure, not that which, which has mixture, not on the stain. Never forget Pastor Martin standing up here in the how not to follow up the training of your children. He held up a piece of paper and he says, what do you see? And there was a little black dot in the middle and 99% of us said, I see a black dot. And he said, no, that's a white sheet of paper with one little black dot. But we focus on the one little black dot. And we can't see what's right about it. All we can see is what's wrong. All we can see is, it's what's, is what's deviated, where it's gone bad. We can't see what's right. We don't see what's pure. We're not looking at the white space. We're looking at the dark space. We're not looking at that which excites reverence, is what the word pure literally means here. That which excites us to, 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 to stand in awe of something. Instead of looking at the height of the mountains, we're looking at the muddy creek over here. That which is lovely. There's a lot of these words that they only appear here by Paul, and there's not a lot of information about them. That's why I'm not spending a lot of time unpacking each and every one of these words. I don't think Paul is painting a portrait for us. I think he's drawing a sketch. And he's leaving a lot of things blank with just some nice sketch lines for us to fill in the inside, for us to pick, get the, the bigger picture. But there's this thing that's lovely. Uh, Nicole, uh, one of the commentators, said, those things which grace attracts. Those things which, which are attracted to grace and those things which grace draws to it, those are the things which are lovely. Those things that are in place, those things that are in order, those things that are, that are, that are proportional, that which is of good repute, these last three things of good repute, moral excellence, and praiseworthy, these things all speak of the things that you want to talk about. Right? The news that you watch, if you watch any news on television, you watch any of the news, it's all the bad stuff going on. Right? And, and if you hear about what's going on in Northern Ireland, or you hear about what's going on in Afghanistan or Pakistan, or, we're always hearing about, well, it's, 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 it's almost, it's very frequently just this one little hot spot. And the rest of the, the rest of the, country is in peace. But here's this hot spot that's really stirring up the problems. He says, let's talk about, and that's why on the news they'll have these, set, these little seasons where they talk about, now for the good news. And they find some little story to make us all happy at the end. The ducklings that made it across the street or, you know, something nice that you can all get warmy and fuzzy about. But Paul's saying here, you know what? Let's spend more time talk, thinking about the good news. The good things, the things that are worthy of commending. Stop talking about and, and fixing your mind upon the things that everybody is, is sharing about how she did that and he did this and they did that and they did this. And start talking about, you know, this happened and this was good. And that person did this and that's commendable. And this person did this and that's worthy of reporting. That's worthy of praise. That's an exceptional moral character. There's valor. There's courage. There's faithfulness. That's what we're going to fix our minds upon. The true, the honorable, the right, the pure, the lovely, the good report, that which is worthy of excellent, that which is excellent, that which is worthy of praise. Now, Paul says this is the treadmill you're supposed to get on. You're supposed to fix your mind on these things. But then one of the commentators made a very important point. He said this. Mere occupation with beautiful sentiments and poetic ideals is not 
what Paul is here planting in the mind. He's not just saying, read a nice poem and feel good about the world. He's not just saying, look at some nice trees or some nice flowers and think poetic thoughts. He's saying these things are a sketch of some things that are really true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and of good report. Things which are truly excellent above all others and worthy of praise. We're to fix our minds, Paul is saying, on some real, concrete realities and models. And there's a sense in which it can be broken down into the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, God the Father, and God the Son. I want to break it down to these four things. First of all, the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit works in people's lives, we see the grace of God in their lives. And when we see the grace of God in their lives, that's worthy of note. That produces things that are right. When we see the Holy Spirit at work in people's lives and we see the grace of God in others in the specific circumstances in which we're living, there are things that are honorable. There are things that will be pure. There we will find things that are truly lovely. For that's what the Spirit produces. And we're going to see that in others. And this is how we're going to come, in a sense, to know something of this peace. It's in getting on this treadmill when we're looking at that brother or sister, we're looking at that other one that we're having problems with, and we're looking not at the problem, we're looking for what's good. We're looking for what's praiseworthy. We're looking for what's honorable. So... In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17, Paul highlights this for the Philippians. He says, brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Find these people and think upon them. And he talks about them in chapter 2. He talks about a couple of them. Timothy, who was a man who was, had a heart like Paul. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven worth, that he served me in the furtherance of the gospel. He says, look at Timothy. There's one. Look at what's notable in him. Fix your mind on that kind of character. Or Epaphroditus. Oh, you're so worried about Epaphroditus' sickness that he might actually die. I'm concerned that he not die. It would bring sorrow, yes. But think about Epaphroditus, the man of prayer. A man committed unto God. A man committed unto you. And think about how God restored him. Think about that situation that's trying to you, that's painful to you. And, and maybe you need to look at it in a little bit different light. Rather than looking at it as an obstacle to your living life, look at it as an opportunity to grow in grace. So you go on that first job and you think, wow, this is the job I've always trained for. This is what I want to do. This is what I've always wanted to do. I didn't really want to work for somebody like that, though. He makes this very difficult for me to do what I really like to do. Well, guess what? God's giving you an opportunity to learn to do what you like to do in some other circumstances. Maybe he's teaching you patience, wisdom, grace. One of the men looked at Yodia and Syntyche, Syntyche in this light, and he said this, painted the picture here, thinking in terms of this verse 8, let Yodia look coldly and critically upon Syntyche and occupy her mind with whatever she can find in her character or ways that is contrary to the virtues here mentioned. And the breach between them will be immeasurably widened. Let Syntyche... Retort by exaggerating every defect and every shortcoming in her sister in Christ, and she will soon become so alienated from her that reconciliation will be almost impossible. 
But then he says, let's think of the opposite. If Yodia, realizing that Syntyche has been redeemed to God by the same precious blood as herself and is indwelt by the same Holy Spirit, determines to think of the virtues or anything worthy of praise in her life and personality, to magnify her graces and minimize her faults, refusing to indulge in unkind criticism, she will be so attracted by what is of Christ in her that she will find herself linked in heart to one from whom she had previously turned coldly away. Rabbi Duncan used to say, and I paraphrase, I don't have the actual quote, every situation is like a mug with two handles. And one is dirty and one is clean. Which one are you going to latch on to? Are you going to grab that dirty one and see everything in it that's bad and wrong and, and negative? Or are you going to grab a hold of the, the clean one and say, you know what? I see in this God doing this. I see in this God doing this. I'll use an illustration here, and I hope my brother Shazad doesn't mind that I use this. When his parents were held up at gunpoint, and they were tied, and their, some of their stuff was stolen. I was talking with Kathy Kahn afterwards, and she told me, she said, you know, I was saying, not for stuff, God, not for stuff. I don't want to die for stuff. And then God delivered her, and, she, and I asked her, did you, did, you, did you change the locks on your house? No. Did you, did you get more guards? No. Well, why not? So, well, God delivered us. I'm the, you know what? You can get robbed again. Well, yeah, but God could deliver us then, too. He says, there's two ways to look at this. I can get really anxious and say, every time I go in that house, it could be that somebody could come in. Or I can say, you know what? God delivered me in the past. Maybe he'll deliver me in the future. I was here late last night. It got really dark, and I finally had to leave. And as I was leaving, I heard some noise. This big building, and it's dark at night. And I'm, I'm preaching on anxiety, right? <laughs> God always does this to me whenever I preach on anxiety. So I walk out in the hallway, and I go, okay, I'm going to step into the men's room. At least there's a light in there. Okay, go quick, quick into the men's room. And I'm saying to myself, you know what? I don't know if anybody's out there in the hall, and I'm getting fearful that there might be somebody out there in the hall. But I know my God is here, and if somebody's out there in the hall and they're going to shoot me, it's because he wants me to die today and he wants to take me home. So I can either sit there and fret, oh man, I have to walk out that dark hallway, there could be somebody there, or I could say, my God's going to walk with me down that hall and nothing will come to me except what he brings to me. I can think true thoughts, honorable thoughts, righteous thoughts, or I can think and get caught up in the anxiety. Which treadmill am I going to get on? Which treadmill are you going to get on? Paul says, get on a different treadmill. But then there's a third piece, and here I, I need to hurry here. There's a third piece to our prescription. Introduce your anxieties to God, your circumstances to God. Get on a different treadmill. Third, do the exercise routine you already have. I have made several exercise routines over my life. I've had others make things up for me. And every time I think about doing exercise, I make a new one. I'm getting older, so I've got to do a few less, right? So it's just, you know, it's a, it, I don't need a new exercise routine. I need to do the ones that have been given to me already. And Paul says, you don't need a new pill. You don't need a new routine. You don't need something new to do. He says in verse 9 of Philippians chapter 4, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. Do you notice that all those words are, are in the past? The things you've learned and received and heard, and seen, they've already come to you, you've already gotten them, practice them. I don't need to give you some new thing to do in order to deal with your anxiety. 
you need to do the things you've already been taught to do. And then he changes the tense and he says, practice, present tense, right now. Go on doing those things you've already been taught. Take up what you already know and do it. Now, if you go back through the book, and I did this, I just went back and did a search on all the imperatives uh, in the book that, that, that Paul said. And just, just going through that, you learn things like this. Here's some of the things that they had heard, that they had learned, that they'd received, that they had seen in Paul living in a fallen world. Chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. How should they live in a fallen world? Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together. He talks in chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, about how to live in peace and unity. He says it's going to require thinking of others as more important than yourself. They're above you. They're the ones you ought to be looking to honor and to emulate rather than to tear down and to stand upon. And you're to labor, to strive, to do all that you can to have unity. Unity of love, unity of affection, unity in compassion, unity of purpose. Of purpose. Not selfish, not proud, but humble like the Lord Jesus. I really jumped ahead of my notes. I dropped some things out. That's okay. Do the exercise routine. Learning what, what I've already told you, how to live in a fallen world, how to deal with others, how to, to live humbly before others. Chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, how to persevere in grace. Chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, stop grumbling. Maybe some of them weren't knowing any peace because they'd heard they were to stop grumbling, and yet they're still grumbling. He tells them to rejoice three different times, actually four, chapter 2, verse 18, 3, 1, and 4, 4, 4, 4, twice. Beware of legalism, chapter 3 and verse 2, stand firm. I thank God that many of you have been here at Trinity Baptist Church for decades. Some of you were born in this place, grown up in this place, you have been taught many good things. There are many solid foundation stones and pillars in the house of God here at Trinity. But maybe some of the times you're wrestling with anxiety, it's at this very point that you know you're not doing what you have been taught time and time and time again. And you don't need a new pill to deal with your anxiety. You need to go back and do the first things. And remember the things which you have been taught and finish those works. Some of you are developing anxieties. Maybe that anxiety grows out of the fact you will not honor your parents. You will not love your wife as a fellow heir of the grace of God. You will not submit to your husband as Lord over you as the church does to Christ in all things. You will not govern your tongue and keep those lies from coming out of your mouth. You will not govern your mind and keep it away from those lustful thoughts. You will not put a filter on your computer. You know what you're supposed to be doing. You know how to walk in holiness. You've heard it dozens, if not hundreds of times. And so it's no wonder that you find yourself being anxious. I pray about it, and I pray about it, and I pray about it. And I fix my mind on the Bible, and I memorize the scriptures, and I go on and on. But I still can't get over this anxiety. Maybe, maybe it's because you're not doing what you know you're supposed to do. And there's a willful disobedience at one particular point. Or more than one particular point. Maybe it's just that you will not believe the promises of God. That God really does care for you. 
that he really is a father who has loving concern for you. And you just won't bring yourself to believe it because you want some measure of control in your life. What is it? I can't. I can't. I can't do that, Pastor Carlson. You can't. Is the grace of God limited in your case? Can you bring that I can't out into the very presence of the living God who created all things by the word of his power and who has a special love for you, his child? Can you bring that out into his presence and introduce him to that which is greater than he is? God, I want, to meet, want you to meet your match. No. There aren't, in some case, there really, in one sense, there are no can'ts. There's won'ts. There's those that are difficult to overcome. But there are no I can'ts. Not in God's realm. Well, the context of all this prescription that I've given you, this prescription drawn from the Apostle Paul, if I can simplify it, it's pray, meditate, and obey. Pray, meditate, and obey. It's all in a particular context. Chapter, the, the par paragraph actually begins in verse 4. You see, this exercise, this, this um, prescription is to be taken with mega doses of purposeful joy. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Purposeful, repeated <laughs> joy. It's to be exercised in groups with gentleness. I am to have this characteristic called gentleness in dealing with others. Not harshness, not lording it over them, not looking down upon them, but gentleness. Now, I already told Pastor Smith I was going to read this long list of, of words because the word is a, kind of a, a unique word. It's got all kinds of nuances to it and and the commentators are all over the place, so Hendrickson does a very nice thing of summarizing all those. And they, he translates it this way, let your big-heartedness be known to everybody. For big-heartedness, one may substitute any one of the following. Forbearance, yieldedness, geniality, kindliness, gentleness, sweet reasonableness, considerateness, charitableness, mildness, magnanimity, generosity. Choose any of them. Choose them all. That's what we're supposed to be toward one another. If we're to enjoy this peace, this is something we do in a context with others, and we have to have that measure of love, concern, humility, forbearance, gentleness toward those around us. And then all of this is to be done under the watchful eye of a great physician. Like any good diet, you don't do it without talking to your, with your doctor. The whole section begins with these words, the Lord is near. So when you pray, he's right there. So when you're trying to fix your mind on something, he's right there. So when you're seeking to do the things that he's told you to do, he's right there. There's a sense in which He's always present. The very present help in time of trouble that psalmist spoke of. The Lord being near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. The father who cares for his children so they can, he can take their anxieties. There's a sense in which he is near. There's also another sense in which he is near. And that's the second coming. The Lord is near. What are you being anxious about? Do you want him to find you fretting? What are you being anxious about? He's going to set all things right. What are you fearful of? He's going to deal with all those things. You can trust him. He will take care of it. He will make it right. If I could summarize it, it's living in the fear of God. Living with the eager anticipation of seeing him and with the earnest preparation for him to see you. And the promised results... Oh, man, out of time. Maybe we'll come back another time. No, I can't do that. 
promised results. The peace of God. The peace of God. Not the peace of the world, not the peace of your pastor, not the peace of your church, the peace of God. Above and beyond all circumstances, outside of all of the changing scenes of life, the peace of God, the immutable, unchangeable, always true, always gracious God who is your Father, the peace from Him is yours. The peace of God, which passes understanding. There is no human reason why God's people can stand at peace in the midst of some of the most difficult circumstances except God. But there's more than that. It passes comprehension like the love of Christ passes understanding. It has no limits. You can't have a circumstance too high that he can't reach you with his peace. You can't go too deep that you can exhaust his peace. There's no limit to the right or to the left. It's a peace which surpasses understanding. And it's a peace which guards our hearts and minds. It sets up a sentry to protect us. And it also is this garrison of, of gracious warriors that go through the heart and find all of the Diabolonians, if you've Never read the Holy War. All of the Diabolonians running around in the heart that seek to stir up from within. And that peace can penetrate down and address those as well. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds, but Paul's not done yet. Look with me at, at verse 9, the last phrase, Philippians 4, verse 9. The God of peace. No, no, not just peace from God. Not just peace from him. The God of peace himself will be with you. The very present help. The one who purchased that peace, it's in Christ Jesus that we have all this, and he has promised the God-man, the one that we read of in Hebrews chapter 1, he has promised never to leave us nor forsake us. This God who is the one who has reconciled us to himself, this God who is the one who can reconcile brethren to one another, this God who is the one who oversees all the world and will one day make all things new and sum them up in Christ, this one will be with you. I didn't just have a nice sense of peace that somehow God was somewhere doing something when I came out through those dark halls last night. I came out through those dark halls knowing that God himself was walking with me. And that's just a small illustration, brethren. But that's what he promises. The God of peace will be with us even to the end of the age. But I close with these words from Isaiah 57. The wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet. And its waters toss up refuge and mud. There is no peace, says the Lord. For the wicked. There's nothing in these things that I've shared today for you who are outside of Christ. There is no peace. There's no peace in this life and there's no peace in the afterlife. Apart from Christ and apart from humbling yourself and calling upon him to save you, you are like the sea that's just churning up mud and there is no settling it down. There is no peace. But I come to you in the name of the God of peace today. And I beg you on behalf of the one who made peace between God and men. I come and I say to you, I beg you. I beg you, be reconciled to God. He extends to you again this day an offer of peace. That having peace with him through Jesus Christ. By confessing your sins, forsaking those sins, and laying hold of Christ, you can be at peace with God, and you can have the God of peace with you forever. And I offer that on the authority of heaven. May God be pleased to work in each of our hearts. Let's pray. Father, be merciful to us and help us to obey your commands, not to be anxious, 
but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to make our requests known to you. Father, help us to fix our minds on those things which you have set before us. And Father, help us. You've taught us so much. You've given us so much. How much, how little we've done of what you've already taught us. Help us to take up those things which you have taught us and to live them out for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.